Welcome into the Door Report. It is episode 172. It is a Wednesday night here in Nashville. It is August 17th, 2022. We are powered by Alaco Finewood Floors. They are family owned and operated for more than two decades. Alaco Finewood Floors is Nashville and Middle Tennessee's choice for premium quality hardwood floors. Since 1995, Jimmy Alaco and his army of employees have embodied the approach of taking pride in one's craft and providing superior customer service if you're interested in contacting them you can find their headquarters at 2505 winford avenue in berry hill or you can call them at 615-356-0303 log on to their website at alacofinewoodfloors.com alaco finewood floors serving middle tennessee's hardwood flooring needs since 1995 all right well we are we are back again we're gonna we're almost ready for two episodes a week we're almost getting to that point, and we'll start that next week. Not as beefy of a week preview with uh, with Hawaii uh, coming up for Vandy, but uh, we'll get to our fall camp impressions. I, I've been to a couple practices. Not sure how deep I'll be able to go, but anything that stood out, we'll talk about that. And will unfortunate news, but Miles Capers out for the season, so uh, we'll run through that news as well. But uh, the big beef part of this episode is the 2022 schedule breakdown. We'll run through the entire schedule and give our predictions for each game. Of course, uh, these these will. It's it's always funny to look back at, at uh, and see if we stay true to, to what we we picked uh, before the season even started. But uh, well, it's it's about that time. We're ten days away. Earl Bennett days away. Earl Bennett days away. That's what I was going to say, Billy. I know you've been tweeting out in that same format from the Door Report Twitter at Door underscore Report in that number of days Uh, away, dot, 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 and then the current player. And I know Gavin Schoenwald (laughs) was the guy today. And I mean this like as possibly the least disrespectful way possible to Gavin Schoenwald. But it just felt wrong when I saw that tweet. I knew it was going to be the current players because that's (laughs) how we've been doing it on the account. But it just felt wrong that number 10 wasn't Earl Bennett. I knew I knew you were gonna fire back. Number six, number six is going to be weird because I know we're just gonna keep going down the list on that current roster, but we all know who in our minds is number six and who should be in in our minds and in our hearts. We we all know, but uh (laughs) Will we uh I I did that last year. I went I went all the old guys. I don't know if you noticed that last year. I went with Earl, (laughs) I went with Jay, uh DJ Moore, of course. We went with him this year, but I said, why not? Let's uh let's tag the players who's who are actually on the team and and some of them have been retweeting them. I know we got we got a few retweets there, but uh, but yeah, in in our minds and hearts, it's Cutler and Bennett. Those uh, and, and I expect a number six Cutler tweet from you as well. So there will up. be one. But, uh, they, there will that you can book that for Will Byram. Will before we get to the breaking news though, don't forget to follow us on Twitter door underscore report and Instagram door dot report. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on Anchor, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. All right, let's get to the breaking news. All right, Will, we start with, uh, I don't know if this isn't breaking news, but uh, you know, we, we've been keeping track uh, of, of fall camp, of, of, of everything we've been able to keep track of. I've been to a couple practices. I went to the first scrimmage. They only had 35 uh, plays in that scrimmage. They were able to get a full scr- scrimmage in on Saturday. Uh, but, Will, apparently Kane and Langston Patterson were all over the field uh, on Saturday in that scrimmage, and, and that's encouraging not only for Kane, but a young guy like Langston. Uh, so those are some rave reviews. Uh, I was at practice yesterday, Will, and looking at Mike Wright, he he looks more accurate. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, and, and I think coming off a, a camp like the Manning Passing Academy, you know, you you go to practice, you look for stuff like that. And, it, you know, it's not like Mike Wright all of a sudden is looking like Jay Cutler out there. But it, he looks a little bit more accurate, and he looks – it looks like a quicker arm. Just, a, you know, we talk about live arms in college football. A.J. Swan's got it. And, you know, we've talked about him having the most arm talent. But Mike Wright, he looks like a quicker arm a little, you know, and in, in, in practice, you can notice that. I don't know about on film or, you know, on TV, but when you're in person, you can really notice that. So I'll say that about Mike Wright. Will Shepard got even bigger uh, in the offseason, and I know that's your guy, Will, and, and he's he's the number one target, uh, un, undisputed. Um, so he does look bigger than he was last year. And, it Will, it was interesting to talk to Coach Lee after practice. He, he sounds more confident. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, we, we've talked about this. I mean, you have to, I mean, sure. You know, I mean, after last season, you know, you, you got to feel more confident, but talking to him about Hawaii, they've got a nine hour flight 
to Hawaii. They leave on Sunday. Um, so they're getting, they're going to be there a week before. Uh, but will the challenge for me, I know we, we'll get to Hawaii more on the schedule, but they're going to fly right back to Nashville on Saturday night, right after the game. They're, they're going to hop on a nine hour flight, get all the way back to Nashville. So to me, that's the challenge in my mind for Vanderbilt, not the prep before the game. And I know that's, that's tough. Obviously it's game number one, but how this team responds with a, a quick turnaround and you got to get back to class Monday. Then you got Elon coming up after that long trip in Hawaii. That's the challenge for me when, when, I, when I look at it. Well, yeah, I was just looking up the calendar, actually, the, the Vanderbilt University academic calendar, because I was curious when they actually start classes, because remember that August 27th game is actually week zero. Yeah. So I'm not sure if they'll be in class leading up to that game, which is probably why they're leaving earlier but like you said that turnaround and we'll get to this when we when we go through our schedule breakdown which is this episode we're trying to talk about the roster just a little bit here but <laughs> that turnaround going into week two against mm -hmm. what i know they are not going to overlook which is an fcs opponent mm -hmm. which is most certainly going to be at the forefront of the minds of players coaches fans everyone is that slip up cannot happen again off short rest coming off a long mm -hmm. plane flight classes are about to start there are a lot of distractions but I have a feeling that those distractions are, are not going to play a factor. I think if there is ever a team that has burned their hand on the stove and is not going to make the same mistake twice of, of not taking an FCS program, I, I think focusing on it enough and being more caught up in things around that opening game. And the other side is Elon's not ETSU. No. So you have the short turnaround, but also ETSU was a damn good FCS program. So mm -hmm. that turnaround, like you mentioned, but I, I've got to find that calendar, Billy. I don't know if you, if the you've school, been able so to uh, see classes, if they'll be in school. I think classes start on Monday after the Hawaii game. So that's another part of the challenge. At, right after that Hawaii game, you got to get some sleep, get to class on Monday. And so uh, that, that's, 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 that's the quick turnaround. And, and I think, I mean, you're at Vanderbilt. You know, it's not like you're playing basketball where you've got to really juggle. Like, if you, you know, you don't have to travel down to, you know, Arkansas on a Tuesday night. But, um, you know, that's that's you're at Vandy. I mean, you, you got to get back to those that that class and uh, and get going and then prep for Elon. So I think that's that's more of the challenge for me as opposed to all the preparation for the trip. That's that's tough in its own. But then that quick turnaround, man that that that's not good. That that's a challenge. So I'm more interested to see. Not how they look against Hawaii. I'm interested in that. But how do they look after that game in week two against Elon? And we'll talk about all this. I know we're already getting into the schedule. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, Will, I mean, I don't know. Do you have any other fall camp takeaways? I don't know if you've heard, you know, what you've heard. But, you know, some of the videos, I know they've been putting those out. Um, but it does look to me like the young guys are active. And they're they're in there. I mean, they're playing, and, and that's what we talked about. That it, before they even got on campus, we said there's a lot of guys that are going to have to play, and that's I think watching some of those videos and seeing the guys out there, that that's that's what it's been. I mean, they've been out there. Well, you said Will Shepard at the wide receiver position, and that is about it. That's about the only returning real experience. Every single down type wide receiver they have returning. Jaden McGowan as a freshman is probably going to be starting in that slot wide receiver position. And the rest of the team, besides running back and quarterback and tight end, really plays out like that at every single position. Mm -hmm. Running back, tight end, quarterback, pretty set. I think running back has a little bit of room in how the split of carries is going to be. Yeah. Is Who's Ramon the number Davis. two? Who's the number two in your mind for, at the running back spot? I, I mean, I think that's... <sighs> It's got Doesn't to be matter. Rocco. It, it has to be Rocco, but I, I think the more interesting thing, I think Rocco and Patrick Smith will split carries situationally. Mm -hmm. We'll have specific packages for them. I think the most interesting part early is going to be, is Ramon Davis truly a workhorse every down starting running back that's getting 70 plus percent of the carries and that 30 percent on third down or so is being split among Rocco Griffin and Patrick Smith when Ramon needs a breather. Or is this really like Ramon Davis is getting like 40, 50 percent and Patrick Smith and Rocco Griffin are splitting somewhere in that 25 to 30 percent. And it's really a split backfield running back by committee situation. My expectation is Ramon Davis is, is going to have the job and that's who you're going to see take a majority of the carries, probably 70 percent. But that's a lot of speculation. You were there. You saw those 35 plays. And I'm sure they're wanting to be careful with Ramon coming off of that injury and getting back to full speed. 
Yeah, I was just going to say that, Will. Um, we've talked about the fans being happy about all that running back depth. Ramon Davis has to be the happiest guy on earth with all that depth behind him. He, he's Last year, I mean, it was him and Rocco was was sort of proven. You also had Patrick Smith by there, but it was really – then, man. It was really I mean, just – I, mean, I mean, you look back at last year, he was the only – somewhat proven running back back there but now you've got a guy like Rocco who's experienced you got Pat Smith a guy that all oh, he's another guy that's gotten bigger and, and and reminds you a lot of Jerron Seymour so there's depth there and so you you look at we've it, been talking there, about Ramon Davis a lot I think we've almost let Patrick Smith kind of slip through that's yeah. who, somebody Patrick Cheek Smith is he yeah. came in <laughs> with the uh with the nickname I don't think that's stuck I don't see that around here as much <laughs> much with Cheeks they're probably stuck in the but, locker room I don't know about yeah. everywhere else <laughs> Yeah, Patrick Smith was showing his flashes at the end of last season that me and you both continuously were talking about him more and more as being a legitimate SEC running back with legitimate flashes of SEC speed and elusiveness. And so uh, allowing him another year to just develop, get bigger, because that's the main issue is, is Patrick Smith going to be able to hold up to taking those hits down in, down out. But you also have Rocco there alongside him. Mm. It's a bigger body, more of a bruising back. So you've got a good combo there. And I think Ramon Davis is kind of the cherry on top of this offense. If he's able to stay healthy this whole season, this offense has potential to take a pretty big step forward in my mind with a mobile quarterback with the offense built around him from the beginning in Mike Wright and all the blocking schemes set up for that combined with a healthy, legit running back in Ramon Davis. Mm -hmm. I'm not dissing Rocco Griffin or Patrick Smith. They could develop into those guys that are dominant running backs, but Ramon Davis healthy is that. He is that right now. There is no more development needed. If he is healthy, he is that dominant. So early on, how does he look? How explosive does he look? And is he fully recovered from the injury? Everything we've seen and heard seem that seems to be the case mm-hmm. obviously cautiously optimistic coming off of any type of injury with the running back there but man billy the closer we get the more excited i'm getting especially with how front loaded in winnable games the yeah. schedule is or games that will really show us what this team is front loaded with that so that yeah. that's that leads to a little more i don't want to say optimism but just a little more looking forward to the season, just with how it's laid out. That sets up nicely. Sets up not nicely. opening up with Georgia. No, no. Sets up nicely <laughs> for Clark Lee. And Will, it also sets up nicely for Ramon Davis to, to really settle in <clears throat> with, with games against Hawaii and Elon to mm-hmm. kind of settle back into that role. So we'll have to see about that and, and how Ramon looks and, of course, the entire offense. But, Will, let's go to the defense here with the second piece of news. And this was a buzz yesterday in practice. Robbie Weinstein came up to me and he asked me about if I had heard anything about Capers. I said, no, Um, you know, I knew he had gotten hurt, but I didn't know any update, Um, but he is done for the season. He suffered. um, I I think it's an ACL, but not, not, it's not official. It's not public yet, but he suffered a leg injury during Monday's practice and, and will undergo surgery very soon. And according to Robbie Weinstein, well, he was going to start on the edge. I mean, he was a, a starter type player uh, on the edge there. So tough blow. I mean, they, they've they've recently gotten healthy on the D line too. They've got a couple guys back, but they're still really really thin at that position. And you know, he he didn't play much last year. Will not sure if he really played at all. Uh, we'll have to look back at that. But I think he uh, had three tackles, unless okay. I misread somewhere. Yeah, so, I, you know, he didn't play much at all, but he had been a, a nice development piece and had been looking really good uh, so far in fall camp. So that's tough. I mean, it, it – Yeah, he played in four games and preserved his red shirt last year. So, so that, that was that so was the deal with Capers. That's, that's good news. He's still got the red shirt, and I'm guessing um, – Well, know, his, he his used that last was... season. He used that. He used his oh, red so shirt did, last you, season. So okay. I, that will be – because remember, you can play the four games. I don't well, know how that you, works you if get you get an additional, an additional You get an additional medical. medical red shirt, I think. You have to apply for it. I'm not really sure how that works. That's yeah. a whole fun, that's, that's mysterious never happened, never happened to either darkness of, of the NCAA where you just submit this application and they randomly approve it. it, it it's thing. like the transfer eligibility applicant applications that they used to. Like they would waive the – uh, penalty of having to sit out the year before you got the free one transfer that they That's instituted ridiculous. a couple years back. And there would be a guy that would be like trying to go to a school that was closer to his family because his grandfather had had an illness that was yeah. terminal and NCAA would say no. Nope. And then just a quarterback that just transferred because he wasn't playing like Justin Fields could just instantaneously play 
and he had like played for the opponent and was clearly doing it just because he got beat out of his spot and they're like you're good to go there's so there's that that's another pain. one of those things is i'm sure they'll find some reason that capers is not eligible for that medical red shirt because it's vanderbilt versus you know one because of the because of course so that's the, just the that's the pessimist because of course the ncaa will mm-hmm. so we'll have mm-hmm. to keep track of that will but they're losing their power they got to keep it keep it when they can <laughs> but in terms of him and his potential this season uh you tweeted about it you said he's a guy that was, that was going to be an interesting piece on the edge and i you know i i i didn't i didn't expect much of him before i started hearing everything about him at fall camp and seeing him and he looks bigger that's just one so, of those names that kept kept popping up it's yeah. not one that we talked about going into it but you just kept reading and multiple people saying that capers was looking good capers mm-hmm. was making plays and it was just a name that came out of nowhere and we said it before and we'll go into the roster more when we lead up to Hawaii but that this defense had a chance to improve on those first 13 to 15 guys and after that it was very thin a lot of unproven uh, unproven pieces and for the most part capers was one of those guys that was one of those pieces that we had moved from unproven to a piece that that we were expecting to be part of that depth and Mm -hmm. and successful rotational pieces maybe even a starter like you said about Robbie mentioning that he may have worked into that spot in the lineup so a big loss for an already thin team that especially if that defensive line with the transfers out just could really lose more at that spot and man it's just I I don't want to I don't it's you already see what problems we are going to be discussing in week three four five six seven Mm -hmm. even if this season starts out how we want it to and how fans want it to and start out with a win over Hawaii and Elon, you start out two and zero, and that would feel amazing. There's still going to be issues pointed out in those games where the defensive line just doesn't have the bodies rotating in or the experience or guys are missing, missing parts where they're supposed to be filling holes and allowing the linebackers to shoot through to make plays on the running back. And you're just going to see that. And that's not really a fault of anyone, even the staff. You just had guys transfer out. Now you combine that with injuries and you just pray, Billy. You just pray you don't see any more. And the and the curse of Coach Kevin Stalling says it hasn't made its way over to the football field. That's just well, what I'll, we kind of hope. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll say this. Darren Agu, Linus Zunk, any of the young D linemen, if you're listening, buckle your chin strap. You're going to play. Yeah. Because they, if if another guy like a Capers, a Devin Lee, if, if anybody else goes down, you already have Davion Davis. Even if it's yet. even if it's just those four games that you can play and still maintain your red shirt, you will be utilized because guys are going to get banged up throughout the season. And with that rule where you can play in four games, there is no doubt. Buckle them up because mm-hmm. you're going to be taking some hits probably in SEC play with yeah. how the schedule plays out. Yeah, And that's why I think Clark Lee recruited strategically and in, in, in looking at the positions, where do we need depth next year immediately? Because that's what, that's how I need to recruit. That's, that's those are the guys. They recruited big body ready guys. Like yeah. si- I, I would say they have to add Darren weight, Agu. but just big frame. Well, guys. Darren Agu, I, I, I saw him at the scrimmage. I went to just walking in onto the field. Whew. Well, I talked to I talked to Darren Agu, and he was here on his visit. Actually, uh, I I just ran into I, it was him and Linus, Linus Zunk, yeah. And I sat there and talked to him for a second, and I was just asking about. That's where I think I brought it up on the podcast that he just mentioned that they were just like left in a room for like thirty <laughs> minutes or an hour, and nobody talked to him. But other than that, it had been a good yeah. visit. But man, those guys are huge. Yeah, they are. They they look in the face. It's weird because they body size. The baby face. Yeah, they look like twenty-eight-year-old grown men, but then you look at them in the <laughs> face, and they look six. Old. Yeah, they look sixteen. <laughs> they look like they should be getting ready for AP Bio. Yeah, so but that's the weird part is is you see them in the helmets, and they're you're like, oh, that's a that's a legit defensive yeah. lineman. You see them take the helmet off, and you think, okay, maybe a year or two, get a little facial hair on there. Because, yeah, man, you look into those eyes for some of those grown men <laughs> on the SEC offensive line. And That'll change your mind. There, yeah, there's just a difference there. Well, but he, uh, it's not even like potential with Darren Agu. It's like he could play right away. He could play mm-hmm. right now. Now, not to the level that, you know, he probably wants to, but he's going to have to play. So we'll keep track of that. Miles Capers, of course, out for the season. We'll have to see how that uh, D line shakes out. But, Will, let's move on to our b- schedule breakdown, the full 2022 schedule breakdown. Uh, we'll talk about each game. We're not going to go in depth. Uh, we're, It'll it's probably be good. focused on the first half. I yes. would say is is probably and that's also like once you get past that first half on top of who it is, it's like 
yeah. a lot of that's going to be what we've seen Pretty repetitive. at that point. Yeah. It's going to be, it's also going to be a lot of like, how have those first six games gone? Yeah. Because if you ask last season for us to do that breakdown, I think our win total wasn't too off. I think we were probably right on, but just how we were talking about the season got blown up week one <laughs> because neither of us saw a loss to ETSU coming. So all yeah. of this, and you have to take it with a grain of salt and say, there can always be something that happens early. Mike Wright goes down, and then every single thing that we've talked about is just out, out the, the window. window. So yeah. it, it'll probably be focused early just because it feels like a waste of time to be talking about Florida or Kentucky. Yeah. In, uh, don't you know, don't expect anyone 11. listening, don't expect us to dive deep into that Tennessee game no. on the 26th <laughs> or <laughs> even the Missouri game on the road. Tennessee, like, Tennessee did open up as 32 and a half point favorites. I saw that. State, I saw so. that. And uh, well, speaking of favorites, Vanderbilt is a six and is it oh. six and a half right now? Six and a half. Six according and a half. To okay. FanDuel, when I checked, according right to before, FanDuel, Vandy is a I six want. and a half point favorite on the road at Hawaii in their in their eight thousand seat soccer stadium that uh, that game will be played in. I'm really interested to see what that looks like on TV. Um, man, it, it, it's it's it, I don't know if it's going to feel like a high school game, but I'm sure for uh, for a lot of people there, it'll remind them of it. But, Will, let's start with that. Hawaii, uh, next Saturday. God, that's insane. Next yeah. Saturday, 10 days away. Um, Will, there, what, this is this is one of my wins for Vanderbilt. This, this. Uh, I'm going to go out and say it. Um, but I want to talk about a couple things. Uh, number one, and I keep going back to Mike Wright, but and you talked about Ramon Davis and your expectations for him against Hawaii. But Mike Wright, what do they do with him? How much do they let him throw? Uh, we know they're going to let him run. They're going to have to let him run a little bit. But what types of do we see any different throws from him? You know, or is it still just boundary? Do we do we see any post routes? Do we see any corner routes that we didn't see a ton of? Um, you know, we saw some deep balls, but what types of throws are we going to see from Mike Wright, and how much does the offense change? So, uh, shocker to no one, I've got that marked down as a win. Will. <laughs> Yeah, I want to go into this Hawaii game just a little bit because it's fascinating. This is just a, a weird game. It's so it's, it's so just weird. so odd it's so weird. to have this schedule. I, I'm not saying I even disagree with it. It's just weird to be flying like to bowl. Hawaii. It feels like a bowl Yes, it's very odd. On top of being at Hawaii, literally as far away as you can possibly play for Vanderbilt, it's in week zero. So you're a week before a majority of the games mm-hmm. are. But like you said, six and a half point favorite. I think that's about, I think I said seven was my guess. So Hammer. once again, Hammer degenerate Hammer. degenerate gambler is correct. Um, no, the, the bet, this is the bet. And I want to put this out here while it's fresh on my mind. Because if I had a million dollars, this is free money. So if anybody out there has money, Vanderbilt's over under on wins is two and a half. Okay. So they if Vanderbilt wins three games, you're, I think last time I looked, it was like plus 100 yeah. it was not even minus 110 so you double your money mm-hmm. Vanderbilt and let me say this loud and clear is going to be the favorite in three games this season or at least even money they're already a favorite against Hawaii six and a half points they are going to be a favorite of probably at least three scores against Elon and they're probably going to be either even money or a two and a half point favorite versus Northern Illinois so bet a ton of money on Vanderbilt over wins. I and mean, then that... bet on Vanderbilt's opponents who are going to be underdogs on those three games. You cannot lose money. And if properly hedged, you will make 50% on whatever you put in. There was a tweet out, and I quoted it and said, shockingly, this was not me. Somebody had put, I, I saw, think it was yeah, $100,000 or whatever it was on Vanderbilt over two wins. That's what they were doing. That's why they did that. And I wanted to quote that and explain that on Twitter, but 280 characters didn't really do that very well. Just go write an article. Yeah, this is where gambling, I think when you break it down and if somebody will listen to you for like two minutes, it's not that complicated. And there's a ton of free money if you pay attention to a team like Vanderbilt out there. But you just mindlessly tweet, somebody put over two wins for Vanderbilt a hundred thousand dollars they must really think that Vanderbilt's going to win more than two games no that's not at all the case they can look at the schedule and say Vanderbilt's going to be favored in three games Mm -hmm. but back to that that, that, that's the (laughs) that's the futures bet of of the season in college yes that's that's the best thing I'm not going to sit here and say Vanderbilt is undoubtedly they're, they're going to be a favorite against Northern Illinois um and that's my most interesting game of the year we'll get to that but I mean hammer over two wins and hammer yes. vandy 
minus six and a half. I mean, I, I don't see why you wouldn't right there, especially yeah, against Hawaii. That's what I want to get to with Hawaii is this is not the Hawaii teams that this I isn't think your the, Rainbow, grandpa's Hawaii. the Rainbow Warrior teams. I think when we were probably in middle school, I think it was Colt Brennan. They had yeah. guys just putting up these crazy numbers with this West Coast style mm-hmm. offense out there. This is not that team. For once, Vanderbilt gets to be on the beneficiary side of a first-time first-year head coach in Hawaii. And they have a first-time head coach in Timmy Chang coming in and taking over a Hawaii program that is literally probably, and this is not an exact, they are literally bottom three to five programs Mm -hmm. in in current talent level in the entire country. And I went through the 24-7 sports composite recruiting rankings so that I could express this in a way that is not just me pulling it out of my ass that they are a bottom five team in all of the FBS you know that Vanderbilt gets constantly wrecked for their recruiting and how they do and they're typically sitting between that 30 and 50 60 range yeah. somewhere in there in the composite ratings sometimes they'll they'll be a little lower in the Franklin years they were able to be in that top 25 composite ranking Hawaii and we'll just go 2022 they were number 126 2021, 125, 2020, 125, 2019, 115. So those are the four years leading up of the talent level that Vanderbilt is playing. That's and there is no excuse, player for player. We break this down in when we go through the rest of the schedule. Player for player, Vanderbilt is so much more talented than this Hawaii team. Their staff has more experience. Not only is Timmy Chang a first time or the new head coach, first time head coach, also their O line coach, Micah Vanterpool, first time. Also, their Look linebackers coach, Panay Pavihi, first time. This has all the recipe for Vanderbilt to slaughter Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Outside of being a Vanderbilt fan, which obviously we have this podcast, we are, but outside of that, and nobody will take me seriously because of how how big of fans we are. This minus six and a half is like the most That's, mind-boggling, unexplainable line. If, it is if only Clark that Lee, because of the names. Yeah. That's if you're it. Clark Lee, take a picture of that, put it on the on the clipboard or whatever you do in the locker room for the for the next week leading up to Hawaii and just let your team look at that. I mean, minus six and a half against have you uh the have you ventured onto ever? the uh Hawaii 24 7 message uh, boards. I didn't even think they had one. They are fascinating because they're few and far between on posts, but there How were did you a few. Get in? Uh, I've got a VIP 24 7 sports <laughs> membership. Don't worry. I, I, I've got us covered. Oh, but that's hilarious. I, I, that's my favorite prep. That's where I get most of my most just, of my good stuff. Is I don't like to read, message boards. You know, I like to read the equivalent of the opponents, Robbie Weinstein. I like to read a couple of their yep. season previews if they have those guys. And then the meat of the breakdown, I go to the message Leaf. boards. Dude, there, there are more insights from people like us and people like the guys on Twitter, Art Goldfinger, all those guys. That's where they post, and that's where the real nitty-gritty is, all right? <laughs> Nash VU, shout out uh, to the shout Twitter out. presence there. Yes, sir. But uh, that's where those guys are, and that's where one of the fans of the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors set the over-under at 3,000 fans. <laughs> and most of the bets were coming in on the under. So I, Honestly, it's one of those where I always like to say it's scale of problem. It's scale of problem because Vanderbilt has attendance issues in scale compared to SEC programs and like right. top tier Big Ten. Three thousand schools, dude. Vandy's worst attendance stuff is like fifteen, like ten. I mean, bottom. Honestly, of their, like, like 10, twenty. 000, ten like thousand looks horrific. I mean, it looks so bad when you see 10,000 in Vanderbilt Stadium because it seats 40,000. Yeah. This is going to look and feel like a high school game. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what kind of impact that's going to have on the field for these guys, if any at all, because just point blank, no excuse. We both, I think, expect Vanderbilt to come out and win this game. And if they perform how they are capable with the talent level on the roster, they will beat Hawaii by two plus scores. And that's my prediction. And we'll go into the breakdown of the matchups in at the individual level a little yeah. more leading up. Yeah, I think Hawaii, obviously, you know, this is the game where we were going to talk about most during this breakdown. But, uh, of course, next week, that's going to be all Hawaii talk. Uh, and, Will, one more thing on their head coach, Timmy Chang. Uh, he has not called plays something like five or six years. 
Like it's been six years since he's even called plays. Um, I heard, I forget where I heard that, but yeah, I mean, if you, if, if Vanderbilt comes out and beats Hawaii, but something like three or doesn't even cover, that will be a, like, I'll be shocked. I'll be utterly shocked if, if, if they don't. So, but that, always, always a little bit nervous about the team that has no expectations yep. and nothing to lose. They were picked in their media poll to finish dead last in the Mountain West Conference. So, Shocker. and keep in mind that's number seven on in the West side of that conference, right below UNLV, who Vanderbilt has had oh, man. a run in with in the past the under Rebels. Derek under Derek Mason and I believe Riley Neal at quarterback mm-hmm. on that on that beloved team right that there. Was a good game. So that, that was a, good game. a that was one of the most disheartening games. <laughs> I won't say like one of the worst, but it was one of the most just from the beginning to end, just disheartening games yeah. was that UNLV game. I, and I think, I feel like I remember there being hope before that. It's like, oh, we'll get back on track against UNLV. Nope. Nope. Yeah. All that went out the window pretty quick. So, uh, but yeah, that's Hawaii. They'll play next Saturday. Unbelievable. That's already here. 10 days away, the 27th, 930 Eastern time kick on, you guessed it, CBS Sports Network, baby. Can't, oh, can't wait to watch that. It's 1030 so. Eastern, right? Is it uh, ten thirty Eastern, nine thirty Central? Oh gosh! Gotcha, on what, gotcha. what I saw on CBS, ten thirty Eastern, nine thirty Central. So I have to stay up for that. You know we will. Uh, but will let's go to week two. Elon again. There's not going to be a whole lot to say about this, but this is similar to Hawaii when you think about it. And I just talked about it earlier. This one I look at and I say I'm more interested in the Elon game than the Hawaii game because of how how will this team respond after a week over a week long basically not a vacation but I mean you, you go to Hawaii you're going to va- you're going on vacation and Clark Lee talked about that he said I, I wish I was going on vacation but I got to go coach a football game and he said there's going to be more stress than than just relaxation of course but um, that's what I'm most looking forward to Will how do they look in this Elon game but and and are there any injuries after that Hawaii game? Just how do they respond from that? So, but it will Elon Hawaii and Elon. I mean, I don't know that there's been a duo of two worst teams on, on a Vanderbilt schedule. I mean, we, we, we thought we were saying that last year with maybe ETSU and Colorado state, but mm. Vanderbilt ends up losing one of them and then beating one of them on a game winning kick. But uh, I, I just, you look at Elon and that's another one. You can't say much else than must win. I mean, if, if, if you don't win, <laughs> Look out because yeah, this is it could get ugly. I mean, it doesn't I matter. don't know. I know more about Hawaii than I do Elon. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I well, yeah, I mean, you got Elon as an FCS program. Trust me, there's a lot more information online <laughs> about Hawaii. I'll tell you that there's very little about Elon. Uh, they're they the not a, Fe- are they the Phoenix? Yeah, they're not a bad FCS program. I think they were like NAIA back in the 80s. They won a couple national championships in 80 and 81. Not the promotion, but man. I think every lesson, everything, it's the same as Hawaii. It's just this is an FCS program. Is You're more talented than this team. There's no doubt. This is not ETSU. I think we didn't expect a loss to ETSU because Vanderbilt had never lost to an FCS program in the history of the football program. So that was not in our thought process. I think we were – but I think in the preview leading up to ETSU – we, we were said, cautious, and we yeah. said this is a good team. They have Quay yeah. Holmes, a running back, who's an NFL running back. This is a top 25. We didn't expect as good as they were mm-hmm. being top five a lot of the season, but this is a top 25 FCS program. This is a very average to pretty good FCS yeah. Elon team. They're average. This is a team that Vanderbilt is way more talented than, unless we are missing something. Are, everything I have seen is this is just a run-of-the-mill FCS program. You cannot write up a better schedule, which these are scheduled years in advance. So you can't do this perfectly. But yeah. these first two games set up to be two and oh. Vanderbilt's going to somehow off the season they had last year be favored in the first two games this year. And I think a lot of what that line is going to I look what like the Elon in, game is going to be. I think that's going to really depend on how they look against Hawaii. Yeah. I think that Hawaii line, I'm kind of surprised they didn't go with minus seven. I think that would have made people a lot more uncomfortable. I think a lot of money is going to come in on Vanderbilt as we go get closer. And yeah. I think that'll push out to seven, seven and a half. So I'd get it now at six and a half. If you can, you'll start mm-hmm. seeing that the odds go to like minus 115, minus 120. As we inch closer, when I last checked, it was at minus 110. But Wow. I would think that Elon game is going to probably be sitting around 16 and a half to 17 and a half. If Vanderbilt looks good against right. Hawaii, it'll be at that 17 and a half. If they yeah. struggle, 
it's going to be around 13 and a half. If they lose, it'll be around nine and a half to 10 points. And then you're, you'll be facing legitimately a must win. And it's yeah. a must win regardless because you cannot lose to FCS programs in back to back seasons. So it doesn't matter who was on that schedule. If it was North Dakota State or UT Martin, you have to beat them. This isn't an option. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no this was a good FCS program. This FCS program surprised us. Hell no. You have to go out and beat them. It cannot happen two years in a row. And there, that will be the beginning of the end for Clark Lee. All faith will be lost if they lose to Elon week two. That will not be the case if they lose to Hawaii. That can happen. It's an FBS program. The talent level is different. I can respect it a little bit more, even if Hawaii is bad. But if they lose to Elon, Billy, I'm officially that, that'll off be the, the train. Edge. But I don't think they will. And I think they'll they'll handle Elon and handle the Phoenix. The uh, Phoenix. With no, without much issue. But... You know, I, I don't want to say that ever, ever, ever again about any team on the schedule ever. I'm with you, Will. I'm uh, I'm I'm with you in every every aspect of that. One thing I look at with these first two games is how well does Vanderbilt run the football? Because you got a team like Hawaii defensively. I mean, Vanderbilt should run all over them. Same thing with Elon. They're an FCS program, and that we talked about the ETSU game last year. Vanderbilt was not able to establish the run whatsoever. I mean, Ramon Davis did a little bit, but he, they were not able to establish the run that like an SEC team should against an FCS team. Mm-hmm. And Elon, that's, you know, middle average team. You should be able to physically dominate them on on, on, on that Saturday. Uh, that'll be the, the September 3rd. You so. asked about Mike Wright with the throwing. And I'm actually curious what were you, what your thoughts were on that, what you're going to see early, because how much of an emphasis will it be on just establishing that our offensive and defensive lines can do it versus yeah. how much of the real offense with the read option stuff that they're wanting to implement against some mm-hmm. of these, I don't want to say better, but more powerful programs, how much are they going to save versus how much are, much are they just going to say, we have to get off to yeah, a good start I'll, here I'll, and just throw the kitchen sink? Yeah, I'll say this, Will, that they they're gonna, they could run for 200 yards against Hawaii and Elon. I mean, that, they, they should. They're, they're, they should. And they can. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect to see Mike Wright, the, the full kitchen sink until Wake Forest. And I think that benefits Vanderbilt. I mean, if you don't show what you really want to do against Wake Forest and then some of those SEC teams, that Wake Forest game. And let's go ahead and get to that because, you know, we got to keep going here at a better pace. Um, but well, it'll start kind of, getting quicker. Yeah, we will. We will. Trust me, it'll get yeah, pretty well. in here in a second. Um, but we'll tra- kind of transitioning into that Wake Forest game. Wake Forest, an ACC team, uh, a really good program right now. Um, and I'll get to the Sam Hartman mm-hmm. you know, drama in, in a minute. <laughs> but in terms of Mike Wright, kind of, I, I that's when I answer that question against a team, an ACC team like Wake Forest, where if you're Vanderbilt and you come out and you compete with a Wake Forest team at home, 11 a.m. kick, you know, maybe things go right. You're able to pull off an upset. You start three and oh. Clark Lee understands that. He knows that, hey, we're not going to come out here against Hawaii and Elon and throw out the kitchen sink and, and show Wake Forest what our passing scheme is. So you look at that Wake Forest game, that's where I think things are really going to start opening up, especially with a guy like Shepard. What, what new things are, gonna, are they going to do with him? Jane McGowan, what, what kind of routes are we seeing with him? And even Bresnahan, too. So I don't even, I think it could be a situation where we may not even see a reception from a guy like Bresnahan until Wake Forest or even, you know, one of the lower receivers. Um, but yeah, so Wake Forest will the thing you look at here is Sam Hartman. If Sam Hartman plays, Vanderbilt's got a puncher's it, my bad. I said it if Sam yeah. Hartman doesn't play, if Sam Hartman doesn't play, Vanderbilt's got a puncher's chance. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna sit here and say if, if Hartman doesn't play, mark it down as a win for Vanderbilt because Wake Forest is still a good program. Clawson has done a tremendous job. Um, in in, uh, in North Carolina up there with Wake Forest. I think that's kind of another example of what Clark Lee could potentially build, looking at a Claw- – what, look what Clawson's done at Wake Forest. I think Clark mm-hmm. can, can do that. Um, but if Hartman plays, I, I'm kind of looking at it no chance for Vanderbilt because um, Hartman's a – I mean, he's, a, he's an NFL draft prospect. But if he doesn't play well, 11 a.m. kick, throw some rain in that weather forecast, look out. I mean uh, – I, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and pick Vanderbilt to win if he doesn't play, but interesting enough, 
that's an early 11 a.m. kick. Wake Forest, I'm not sure the last time they came over to Vanderbilt to play. I think it was when Jordan Matthews, uh, of course, had that reception. I think that's the last time Wake Forest played I at think Vanderbilt. That's right. Um, so who knows, Will? Uh, but the Wake Forest game after Hawaii and Elon, what 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 differences do we see offensively? That's what I look at as well. Um, but Hartman, I mean, Hartman's the the X factor. Does he, does he play or does he not? It's week three too. So it's not like it's later in the season that sets up pretty well for Vandy. Look, so I don't know if you watched QB one on Netflix. I don't, I don't know if you watched watched a little bit of it. So I would highly recommend that show to any football fans. If you're looking to fill the next 10 days with football, if you've already seen last chance, you, uh, which the first two seasons are much better than the remaining seasons of that show. QB1 is the only other football show that's following college or high school that I've enjoyed almost as much. And it follows three of the three or four of the highest rated quarterback recruits in whatever year's class in their senior year of high school. It had Justin Fields, yeah. uh, Spencer Rattler, which we'll get to on, on the rest of this preview. Uh, but Sam Hartman was on it, and he was actually probably the most likable one. He transferred from a powerhouse school, followed his coach, went to some crappy school, and was literally dealing, were literally dealing with kids that, that looked like they'd never played football before. And he had some type of thyroid issue and almost died, lost a ton of weight. And so I'm assuming it has something to do with that, and yeah. I would be shocked if he plays this season based on how serious that was when he was in high school. So first off, just absolutely terrible that he's dealing with yeah, that after the awful. season that he had. So put that out there to begin with. If if you want to get to know Wake Forest quarterback a little more or watch a good football show, go that? and watch that. Our prayers and thoughts are with Sam Hartman. So mm-hmm. we'll put that out there first so we don't, don't sound like complete assholes talking okay. about his medical condition and talking about how it's advantageous to Vanderbilt's Chances look at you, of beating look at you being all virtuous. Yeah, well. yeah like look, at that. look at that. I, I just like I, I'm starting to see things in a little more context here, and I'm like, I was just listening to you, and I was like, I don't, I think that we know <laughs> that we're like, okay, first off, this is awful, and like yeah. we wish it would not have happened, and so Man, we put I that out the there. We know that, that. I, but we have to, we have to record that credit, before credit they don't. <laughs> Credit to you. They don't get to but see our, no doubt. See our I combos, mean, but they're number 22 in the A people. I mean, this is a good team regardless of Hartman. Yeah. So that's, it, that's, it definitely increases the chances of it, but it's also going to be that, I mean, what do we see week one and two? I, this week one against Hawaii, I don't know how, has there been a game that more of like an entire, the expectations of an entire season have hinged on like the first half of a game more than the first half of that Hawaii game because he has you know I, last year man but even then you're like it's first year I think you can even with how bad that was you can like just wash it away and say okay that first year was just a wash like you can say it was inexperience it was getting the feet you had so maybe. much turmoil and turnover right but you can say maybe yeah. like that's what I'm getting at is I'm not saying I agree with it but you can say maybe right, you can make right. a case that is not the case this year like it, and you have so much turnover, even though the roster has a lot of the same names on it. That's the mm-hmm. weird part. It's just like all these names that weren't able to take that step last season, this season we're going to see. Yeah. And in that first half, you're just you're going to see this team take shape. And by week three in that Wake Forest, I think you'll know on that offensive and defensive line yeah. where, the, where the holes are, where the missing pieces are. But I think that they're – early on in the first three games of the season, not going to make the same mistake, which is you're going to see a lot more quick Mm -hmm. passes, a lot more quick speed developing plays. It's what you saw in the spring game. I know a lot can change from that, but it seemed like a lot of those things were quick bubble screens, little dump offs to the tight end, simple reads coming in front of Mike Wright, not these long developing deep routes like you saw early on against ETSU in Colorado State that just weren't necessary. I think they were trying to work on too much early versus doing the simple things, getting those down against an inferiorly talented opponent, and then moving on once you kind of develop those staples of your offense. So I think this year early, I think you'll see a lot more quick stuff. You'll see a lot more of just basics early on, and they'll kind of grow from there versus I think they were probably trying to do too much too early last season. Yeah. And well, I think that's just an experience. Last year, th- let's face it, this team looked absolutely lost 
against ETSU. I mean, they look, the whole team, not just Coach Lee, not just all the other coaches, the entire team looked like one big old deer in the headlights. It I mean, looked like it, they needed two or three more weeks. Yeah, really. I mean, it looked like they just were, they, they it caught them off guard that all of a sudden uh, they got to play a game on in week one. and But now it's week zero. So it, 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 now year two of Coach Lee, you're playing in week zero, and it's a weird-ass trip. I mean, nine-hour flight all the way to Hawaii. So, well, I'm I completely agree. Um, and you look at this matchup; it, it's it's obviously not ETSU, but it's a team. It is a it is an opponent, and I'm not ready to sit here and say that I think Vanderbilt's going to dominate Hawaii. I'm just I'm not. I mean, I I think yes, they you know I mean <laughs> you see what I'm saying a little. I bit want like, to so bad. Yeah, I, I mean, want I'm, to. I'm I'm on the verge now. If they come out and beat Hawaii by thirty, Elon, I'm going to be saying the same. I'm I'm going to be saying they need they should beat and they can. I think they will come out and knock the the brakes off Elon. But You're wearing with, a Notre Dame shirt, Billy. I am. I am. Why? I, I it was in my closet. I grabbed it. We, we're Catholics. Is it now. because the Manti Teo uh, documentary <laughs> dropped? Today? No, that's insane. By the way. Uh, but that's well, an incredible, I, incredible story. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with me or not. I think you do. By the way, you're nodding. Um, I'm just not ready. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm going to pick them lose to Hawaii, but I'm just saying I'm not ready to pick them. Like I've heard some people are a, a 20, 30 point win. No, maybe they do get it, but I'm not. I'm just with where this program is. I'm just not ready. I'm not ready yeah. to take that step. I, I got. We, we were on the Wake Forest game, and and I want to get back yeah. to that. But first, I want. I mean. We're bouncing around. Yeah, we got we got to get to the Wake Forest game. So I'm going to get my line out there because I went through every game and kind of set a preliminary line. If you could bet all the games right now, where I think it would sit at, and I think Vanderbilt's at probably plus eighteen, plus twenty one. Yeah. With this is under the assumption that Sam Hartman is out. So I would put if them he does that play. if he does play, that's going to be like twenty three, twenty four, yeah. somewhere in there. It's going to be in that four score range. But I would say that plus 18, plus 20, somewhere in that. And yeah. just depending on how the beginning of the season goes, the further out you get, the more it just depends on how these teams look and how things shape out. But back to the Hawaii, what you were saying of not wanting to pick them to yeah. be to, to have this win, I think it's more just looking at Hawaii. Yeah. I just look at them. and it, So take Vandy out of the equation. So I one of my big gambling things that I do, I usually make most of my money in the first four to six weeks because Vegas just doesn't adjust. It, it's easy to find edges because the gambling market is not Vegas looking at the game and predicting it. Vegas is trying to get 50% of the money on either side. Now, sometimes that gets a little more complicated, whatever. We won't get into mm -hmm. that. But that's the basics is they're trying to get 50% of the public money on either side. So name matters. So like if you have Ohio State or Bama versus no name, it's naturally going to have three to five points added to it because the public is just going to bet on mm -hmm. it. And that's just yeah. going to happen. Or if there's a large line, a lot of those times, a lot of the sheer times amount they're, they're of not as high. that's coming in. Yeah. So everything about Hawaii screams a team that is going to get blasted week one. I mean, all their recruiting stuff, and like I listed off, they haven't had a class above 115 since 2018. 2018 was 96. 2017 was 86th ranked national recruiting class. So looking at the trend of the program, they just have a new first-time head coach. They have new position coaches. They had a ton of transfers out. It's starting off against a, an opponent that you can look at it two ways. They have nothing to lose. It's, it's or Vandy it's, last or, season. Or it's like you, they can look at that opponent and say, man, this is a brutal way to start. This tenure when we play in the Mountain West, even if it yeah. is Vanderbilt, this is a team with something to prove coming in. Let's just get through this. And you have the inexperience factor. That's my number one criteria is first-time, first-year head coaches in their openers. And especially if they're in any type of fanfare associated with them. Week zero, Thursday night kicks, primetime kicks, big matchups, anything like that. First-time head coaches. Man, there's just nothing like having one year under your belt knowing how an entire season goes and knowing how an entire off season needs to build up to be prepared for week one. Clark Lee has that. The staff has that for the most part. Now I have a lot more confidence going into this, not just because of year two with Vanderbilt and the staff and the improved talent, 
just looking at Hawaii, everything about that team, if I remove Vanderbilt from the equation as a team, that I'm going to feel really confident in their opponent coming in and dominating them uh, in the opening week of the season. So this is more an anti-Hawaii, kind of like a lot of the recent presidential elections, all right? (laughs) I'm voting against. It's an against vote Vote more than anything else. Vote no. Oh, man. Well, we got to keep running. I don't even have to say a name. That works on both sides is the funny part of that statement. Oh man. Okay. So after, after Wake Forest, uh, whatever happens in that game, Vanderbilt is going to travel up to Northern Illinois, September the 17th. Very, very sneaky game. Um, I have no clue about this game. Obviously my first thought is, Oh, at Northern Illinois. Oh yeah. Vanderbilt. Nope. That's a cakewalk. Vanderbilt should win that game, but you look a little bit deeper. What happened last year with this Vanderbilt Mm -hmm. team and everything we know about this program that is going to be a difficult challenge. It just is. And at Northern Illinois is a tremendous program. I mean, what they've done up there in in, in what conference are they in, Will? Uh, I forget what. They are in the MAC, the Mac Mid-American Conference, okay. conference I mean, which they won last season. Exactly. So I want to point that out. The reigning, <laughs> the reigning MAC champs, uh, and they're going to be fired up to 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 bring Vanderbilt and SEC team into their stadium. Um, I wish this game was on a Tuesday night because this would be perfect for a Tuesday night. Vanderbilt at Northern Illinois. uh, Obviously, Vanderbilt probably wouldn't like that. But, uh, Will, I I, I struggled picking Vanderbilt to win this one. I really did. And this is the game. This is the game that betters right now are looking at and just studying about studying both teams. This is the hardest one to set the whole season. This might be a pick them. Literally, it's it might Vanderbilt. I think is going to yeah. be the favorite, but if they are, it's going to be a, they're going to be a two or a three point fan. It, I, I just now if they come out and and you know demolish Hawaii it's and at Hawaii, Northern and, Illinois is the weird part. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's where I'm the going part with, with the line. I would be on that side, but I they the pick them is what I'm what I'm kind of leaning towards right now. When I, I mean, it. you look at it's at Northern Illinois. Vanderbilt's probably going to be coming off a, a, a let's face it, a beat down against Wake Forest. If Wake if Sam Hartman plays, if he doesn't, you know, Vanderbilt I, may just go ahead and talk. But, go ahead and talk like he's he's not going to play. Okay, so I mean, so, I would I would be shocked even if, if even he if he plays. even if he doesn't play, I don't think they're going to beat Wake Forest. I, you know, mm-hmm. so they're they're coming off a Wake Forest loss. Mm-hmm. It's at Northern Illinois. Let's face it, that should be a pick em. I mean, we don't know. Now, maybe week four we say differently because of what Vanderbilt has done and how they look. Um, but, man, you look at that game. and and But, Will, if they lose, it's, okay, you lost it. They're a really good team. You know, they're probably going to win the MAC this year. They won it last year. But if you win that game, and I'm not even going to say heading into Alabama, that doesn't matter either way. But if you win that game, you're likely at 3-1. and one, And you're going to Tuscaloosa – with you know you're we going want to them. yeah but i say that in, in that you're if vanderbilt was you know say they were two and two heading in alabama or god forbid one and three but you're three and one that's a level of respect you know heading mm-hmm. into t-town not saying vanderbilt oh oh well, well you've already exceeded if that's the case you've exceeded your win total from last year so exactly. that's nothing to scoff at if that would somehow yeah. dream i mean i don't want to say dream scenario because i think dream <laughs> in the dreams is somehow pulling off that upset four and oh before the gauntlet begins yeah uh, which we're about to get into which is when this quick yeah, but will that's <laughs> we gotta really speed it up but will the uh, better nah, every pe- people are excited man they they are fired up ready to eat up they the are fired up here, fired ready to rock. Up. but will bet every better in the country would be praising vanderbilt it, it, because i think there's going to be a lot a decent amount of futures bets on Vanderbilt plus two and a half wins. I really do. I think you agree too. So there's going to be betters watching that game, especially the first four games of Vanderbilt season. But, well, Northern Illinois, uh, I said my spiel. Um, again, I think it's going to be a pick em, but there's kind of a – there's there's a big reward there. I, it feels weird saying that. But if you beat Northern Illinois, I feel like I'm talking about an SEC game on the road. But if you go up and beat at Northern Illinois, that kind of changes the tone, I, I think – Maybe not nationally, but I think locally. Oh, they're at three wins now. You know, you got got a win at Northern Illinois under your belt. That changes the tone a little bit, I think, on the season. Yeah, this is one of the swing games. There are a couple games in the yeah. SEC that a lot of it is going to depend on how these SEC teams look. But I think Hawaii and Elon 
going into the year, I don't think it's insane to say those are expectations. Those are wins expected. And I think that this Northern Illinois is like 60% leaning that direction, but it is probably the third most winnable. I mean, definitely the third most winnable looking at the schedule and, and running through it. But this is where the season can go from being like, okay, you know, you met the minimum standard, which is going to be winning the first two games. Of the right. Season. You, you the achieved standard. You achieved the minimum where it's like, we're not calling for your job in year two. Yeah. Three wins is I think the expectation of feeling, you know, not would you good. call that a successful season I would, this year? I would give that like a C, like a C plus, okay. because it just coming off of what you a zero win and then a two win season, I don't want to scoff at any increase in win total because in the end <laughs> that's what matters is mm -hmm. your wins and your win total and that increasing and improving and positive forward momentum with a young team and a young staff and a new brand that you're trying to create with a more aligned administration. But I wouldn't say it's success. I think that's probably a bit of yeah. a stretch. I think if you win this NIU game, that sets up for you being three and one going into the SEC gauntlet and saying, you just have to pick up one of these games. And I think no matter how much I want, I hate saying what I'm about to say. Four wins is is a successful season. Oh I yeah, mean, I I think I mean, without you without a doubt total, you've probably either beaten Wake Forest or won an SEC game. One of yeah. those two, which this would be the year that they I don't say need to because it's going to be a hell of a time, especially all back to back to back to back to back to back. But it's been a while since we felt an SEC victory yeah. and just the confidence that would build of belonging that would feel roster, I, there are a lot of guys that haven't experienced what that is like i think that would feel that would almost feel like right now for vandy fans that would feel like an sec title like you win mm -hmm. an sec game that's where they are that's where this program is right now so but will real quick real quick back to hawaii bryce smith from the vandy hustler just tweeted there's a five-way quarterback battle going on at hawaii <laughs> that's how you know all oh, successful man. teams are built with the, <laughs> the main position and main leader being a five-way battle uh, oh, 10 days out. But I do want to – let's reset before man. we hit the, before we hit the SEC. Uh, those first four games have released times and where they're expected yes. to be shown. Uh, let's let's hear them, those. So on 8-27, week zero, game one, 10.30 p.m. Eastern at Hawaii on CBS Sports Network. Yep. Uh, game two – on September 3rd at home against Elon, 7 p.m. Eastern Ooh. on ESPN+. Plus. So oh. that, we'll see. Uh, like I said, all this is preliminary. Like and a lot, yeah, a lot of these will change. Um, that Wake Forest game, this is one that has potential, depending on how the beginning of the year goes to change. Right now it's a noon kickoff on SEC Network um, for that Wake up. Forest game in game three. And then the last one that there's any information on out there CBS. is at Northern Illinois. You guess it, <laughs> CBS Sports Network, 3.30 p.m. Eastern uh, for game four at Northern Illinois for Vanderbilt before they enter the SEC. Goal. They need to call that the Vanderbilt Sports Network. The <laughs> that was like that. Oh, man. Well, let's keep rolling on here. We're only four games in um, at Alabama. Uh, on my notes, I've written well. That's that's it. <laughs> well, well, you remember last time they played at Alabama? I remember the last time they played Alabama at home. I was there. I was there too. But but specifically at Alabama, Jordan Rogers almost almost died. Like they, they, oh, Mark Barron. Yeah. Mark Barron absolutely leveled him. And, and that's what I remember about that game. Uh, I think Vanderbilt lost 42 to nothing. I, if Vanderbilt loses 42 nothing to Bama this year, hey, you, you, you didn't lose by 60. I mean, and you got so the I leading think, Heisman candidate. On top of everyone else there. And you got Will Anderson coming at uh, Mike Wright. So, But, Will, it, with these SEC games, you saw what happened last year. 60, was it, wasn't it? Was it 60 last year against Georgia? 62? 62 nothing. Um, it could have been and, as bad as they wanted. So, 62 nothing against Georgia. You, you, you just can't. You got to show progress against a team like Bama. I don't know how you do, but not losing by 60. I mean, that Georgia that Georgia score you just said, it's kind of like when you do 
So in golf, guys will usually either do a triple bogey cap or they'll do double par. So the max you can get on a par five is plus five. And so right when you begin playing golf, you know, you'll shoot like a one. If you're honest, you'll shoot like a 105, 110. Mm -hmm. And that 105, 110 is, you know, it's honest, but it's a lot of like holes that were the triple bogey cap, the triple bogey, not even Mulligan, but the triple bogey cap. (laughs) It's not that it saves you on every hole. I mean, you know, 13 out of 18 holes, you don't need it. But on those, it prevents you. It prevents you from like having one of those ten shot holes where you just screw it up. Yeah, that's kind of like what this Vanderbilt Georgia score was last season. <laughs> Georgia could have scored two hundred if they wanted to and pressed their foot on the gas. There's the progress this year would be like really losing, like full gas, sixty two nothing, like not like last year where you are actually like you're putting the ball in on the plus three on that stroke for you on the par three like you're actually hitting that score and you're actually shooting a 100 versus you shot a 105 but really a shot like a 130 if it was pga tour scoring if georgia wanted to that game could have been 150 to nothing yeah and there is zero doubt about that and that was the best defense i've ever seen in person and it won a national championship but just looking like you're playing the same sport and you're not in a completely different league. They looked FBS versus FCS. What that should look like, that's what Georgia and Vanderbilt's gap of talent differential looked like. So this year, I want to look more like this is the 14th out of 14th team in the SEC versus the number one or number two team in the SEC. Still yeah. a big gap, but that's a legit 105 you just shot on 18 holes not a cap 110 105 you just shot so improvement but i don't think competitiveness is even the right word no i mean i i don't i think next year maybe is the year you start when you play georgia and you know i don't think that they don't play alabama next year but you know you play georgia next year then it's it's time to 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 start talking about some of those things but i think this year it's still the same as last year i mean um that gauntlet at Alabama, Ole Miss at home, and then at Georgia. And you have the bye week. You have the bye week in there in you between got, got the Alabama and Ole Miss, between, which is big. Yeah, you got That's the bye big. week in between Bama and Ole Miss. Uh, mm-hmm. Lane Train coming into Nashville oh. October the eighth, so that should be fun. He'll be on Broadway. Oh yeah, he'll, he'll bring his uh, his punter who he grabbed at a keg party too. So, um, but well, at Georgia, I mean, at Georgia and Al- at Alabama. Does it get any more brutal than that? I mean, that, that, I mean that that, that schedules that what? three game stretch. I feel like we're we'll lead up to it and break that down when we get there in the season. But Bama and Georgia are going to be th- those thirty five and a half to thirty seven and a half point lines, and with an over under at you know fifty nine and a half, and all of that almost is yep. based on what they expect Bama or Georgia to score. So. The Ole Miss game is also going to be a very high line, but for a different reason. It's because Lane Kiffin is going to just score a lot more points and it's play a little like bit Mike differently. Leach last year. Yeah, the over under will be a lot higher on that game. But those three games, you're going to be four, five plus point or score underdogs, not mm-hmm. point score underdogs and i don't really see a point in in breaking those down i no. i don't see a realistic shot unless the and all this can be changed and and we'll have more to evaluate position and stuff to break down how bama will miss and georgia look how vanderbilt looks but right now looking at those you can almost chalk those up as losses all yeah four I, to five I will, score plus lines yeah i will say Ole miss at home you know obviously out of those three is mm-hmm. the one you would maybe expect Vanderbilt to compete in just because it is at home and they're, they're bringing in a new quarterback, Jackson Dart, uh, who I don't, he, he can't be as good as Matt Corral. I mean, Matt Corral was ridiculous. So, uh, but even then it's still Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin at home. Um, but will with those three games, that pocket of three games there at Bama, Ole Miss at home, and then at Georgia, I'm looking at how do they respond? We, you know, we, how, how do they come back from that gauntlet? We saw Derek Mason. That was the beginning of the end for Coach Mason, that Alabama loss at home. It was embarrassing. It was, it was everything. It had everything that that Mason needed to kind of start the end. And that's that's how it started. So does that happen with Clark Lee? Now, obviously, Clark Lee, we've talked about it. He's here to stay, yada, yada, yada. So I don't think that that's a different scenario. 
but still, you know, you still got Missouri, South Carolina, Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee after that gauntlet. So it does not slow down. I mean, well, at Missouri. So the it, Missouri game, I really wished the buys were scheduled a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So I like having the bye after that first four games, after the the only four out of conference games that we broke down that they actually have times and TV stations for. Then you have four games again in at Bama versus Ole Miss at Georgia and at Missouri. Then you have another bye week. I really wish that there was a bye week in between Before that Georgia Missouri. and Missouri. Yeah. Because Missouri, looking at this schedule, Missouri and South Carolina are by far, yep. in my opinion the two most winnable games on the schedule. That's what I've heard from everybody. And a lot of, and I don't think, yeah, I was about to say, I don't think that's a controversial opinion. And a lot of the South Carolina is just the complete wild card of what the hell is Spencer Rattler going to be there. And what happened last year. I mean, yeah, Vanderbilt, the the gap between Vandy and South Mm -hmm. Carolina is not as big. It's not as big. And so, and And that's at home last year. So, and yeah, and it's at home. So honestly, Will, would you say they have a better chance of beating South Carolina than Mizzou, or is it Mizzou for you? Well, South Carolina is the number one that I point to for a, for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it's going to come down to Spencer Rattler. I just keep saying that. That's too late in the season. We will know. I feel like, that. Will, I I feel bad that's saying this, go. but I feel like this is a type of season where something's going to happen with Rattler, whether he mm-hmm. suffers an injury. I, it just feels weird. It, it doesn't. I'm not as confident in Rattler as a lot as I've heard. Now I'm not saying there's Spencer people. Rattler also was on QB one. If yeah. uh, if you're wondering, so you can follow him. He was not as likable as Sam Hartman. I've heard that. I I normally do feel bad about giving opinions of young men because they're younger, and I was kind of you know we all were. If you're a male and we, you were, we all, we all were, we're all kind of college. kind of little little asses, but. <laughs> he was pretty unlikable like it, it's usually i can see past like justin fields had moments of kind of entitlement but i look back and i'm like at 17 if i had national recruiting attention on me I would talking have an about ego too yeah i would have an ego so like i have to take a step back even with that spencer rattler not the kind of personality that i think can rally a team. men in college would rally around mm-hmm. the opposite of the mike Wright. that is how i would describe yes. it the opposite of how ken seals has conducted himself throughout losing the starting job and just being unbelievable, a better professional than most NFL players when yeah. they lose their starting job, I will say. And I don't think he's been given enough credit for what Ken Seals has done and stayed and I continued agree. to say the right things. And that's not an easy thing to do. So no. I, I want to say that, but that also Missouri has got a first year starting quarterback. Yes, they do. And, and that it's, is it's interesting that I am excited about. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's why I struggle with it. I mean, Rattler is somewhat proven, but you look at Mizzou, they if they lose some some games that they, they they should win early on in the season and they start going downhill, that's a very that becomes a very trendy pick for Vanderbilt, but for Vanderbilt they're also coming off that gauntlet. Alabama, Auburn, exactly. Georgia. So that's why I how, pointed out South Carolina because you there. have the week of you have the bye week. You have the build up and you're coming off of an at Missouri game that is going to be very important, but is the tail end of that gauntlet of physicality of games. Mm-hmm. Because Georgia and Bama are going to be the two most physical games of the year. Probably Kentucky number three, uh, just looking down that last list of physicality in the trenches. Ole Miss, a little bit more of an air raid style, but Missouri is, I mean, that's going to be when the rubber hits the road. Yep. You have your two games that are your opportunities to break that SEC losing streak. And I don't care what they say to the media. I don't care with that wasn't even our team in the 0-9 year. That is in the back of the minds of of the team. And you can use that as as one of two things. It can be a distraction that can kill your confidence and prevent you from achieving and and getting to that level. And you go into the game like we haven't won uh, an SEC game and however many it's been in a row like what's even, me. you know drag yourself you have your first four out of conference games you go two and two you're like whatever man three wins max through this but yeah whatever but you can also you can use it as fuel and hopefully that is going to be the fuel of they're changing everything the white helmets the logo Ooh. what's on the field I like them. I, I I actually I with, hated with the, v, the block V with how much I hated the block with, V with the white the V has grown on me on that white with the stri- the gold stripe too 
I it's still not, it's not bad. Still it's going back bad. to that schedule release or not schedule logo release, Billy. Those oh. initial graphics were like still. I don't know what they were doing. It doesn't. It, it, it felt like have, a joke. It felt unfinished. It was like a rough draft of what the V looks like. Is it a basic V? Yes. But what they put on to the helmets, and I see why they chose it versus yeah. what they released, which was just like flat on a sheet of paper. It looks pretty stupid. And it was kind of out of nowhere right after building all this around the Star V. And so seeing it on those helmets, man, not I bad. Can, I not... get it. I This is what I kept hitting at also, is I love, love the Star V, but I get why you want to separate from it. I get it. It has yeah. brand recognition, but man... Is it the brand recognition that you want? That you want? Yeah. Because I know it means a lot to us, but maybe you did need an outside perspective to say, even though this means a lot to this 20 to 40,000, however many diehard fans are out there, to gain and, and build an SEC real fan base around this program, you just have to cut clean. And yeah. separate and, and just build a new brand and so maybe billy maybe it's going to look a little better than those uniforms did on maybe. tv last year I'll, I'll say this will the 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 v the v on the helmet looks good the white helmet looks good um but the shine on the helmet looks so much better than the matte that mason threw out there on the mat the matte black helmet and they also had there was no shine on their on any of their helmets so there were just too many chains on mason's chains stuff. Anchors, the, there was too much he had some good just, stuff. It's too much. Yeah. It's too much. A little, stuff. little too much. A little too much. But <laughs> George or George. No, George. Will, there we go. Will. Um, I'll I take that a as a compliment. <laughs> I got a chance to talk to Anthony Orgy at SEC Media Days, and I asked him about a game. <laughs> I asked him about a game last year. Is there a game last year that you want that you it just it still hurts that that you you could you could definitely want to have back? He said South Carolina. He said the South Carolina game and me and, too, Anthony. <laughs> and hearing that from him, it felt like okay, this entire team because he's a leader on that defense. This entire team, they're looking at that South Carolina game. I guarantee you, they're circling that game. I guarantee you, and they've got them at home. That, that that's watch out for that one. Uh, just Are watch we out. at home? The, in the bad taste in the mouth. Yeah. That is the game that from the moment the schedule was released, that that was the circle. That was the yeah. that was the one going into this year that I think one of those Missouri or South Carolina games, like we said about NIU, that's a turning point game. That three week stretch, which is one of the one of them is a bye week, but that three week stretch of Missouri bye week, South Carolina. One just like that, just like that beginning of the year, there's a huge difference in three and one versus two and two. Right there, picking up one of those games makes or breaks the difference in this year of the ability to like over overachieve from that three win expectation. I don't see a way to get more than three wins unless something crazy happens without picking up one of those two games. Just yeah. looking, UK, UF, and UT. The yeah, U's the, at the end are are all going to be some tough matchups. Yeah, all three of those at the end. I look at Miz, I We both separate Mizzou and South Carolina. We're in agreement there. But those last three games, it's just I don't see it. I, I just don't see it. Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee, Florida. I would call that one the most winnable, um, just because Florida, whenever they come to West End, crazy shit happens like every every single time. So that has potential to be interesting a little bit, but uh, it's it. it it's not going to happen. I, I just don't see any wins happening past Mizzou and South Carolina. And Kentucky's, uh, it's not, it's not fair. They're not allowed. They're supposed to be. They're not allowed there. to be good. They're at not football. allowed to be good at football. It, you're not allowed to be that good at basketball. And now you can Stoops be a basketball school. You can be good at basketball or baseball, or you can be, well, really it's just, you can be good at basketball or football. You don't get to be good at both at the same time. All right, you can be good at baseball and be good at football at the That's same time. That's just Kentucky. You are not allowed to be good at basketball and be good at football. So Kentucky, something is coming your way, some bad juju. I don't <laughs> know what it is, but the football gods, the SEC power gods, are not going to allow this because they also have a really good gymnastics program too. Really? I think, it's kind of, it, I think you're only allowed – I've got to do some research on this, Billy. I don't know. I, sh I should have dug into this a little more, but uh, – we should have done how many championship level programs you're allowed to house at once within each academic yeah. department because Vanderbilt's got women's bowling, men's golf, 
and baseball right now. So is it three? Is it four? Because Kentucky's got basketball, not national championship, but just really good. Yeah. And, you know, basketball, football, gymnastics. Yeah. Is there Watch a fourth? Out. Is there a fourth? But <laughs> I don't there? know, Billy, but Kentucky, those last three games, like we were yeah, saying, I, that was a little off topic. I don't, where do you see the win total here? If you just had to put a number out there and how confident you are. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not confident in three wins. And I, I, I don't want to say that. I really don't. But I would say my confidence level right now on Vanderbilt getting three wins is about 50. I mean, I, so you were because of the pick game. It's so funny to me that you it, – so you were Vegas. You were the two-and-a-half win total. Like yes. Literally I, I what literally you just am. described I, is you were Vegas. And, Will, but it'll this will all change if they beat Hawaii and – if they beat the breaks off Hawaii and Elon. Like, that'll change for me. I'll say, yep, book it. They're three wins because I don't see them losing to Northern Illinois. They're just – they're better. But I'm not ready. Where, where, this, where this program is, I'm just not ready. I, I, I can't commit to that yet. So – uh, wow, we did it, Will. It's it, it's over. The schedule breakdown sh- is over. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at that, Billy. I'm gonna be honest because <laughs> if if I had to put my my win total or whatever, I would I would say three. I mean, I would. Let, I, I still less say than three. Three I'm... will have me in the season recap. That's the <laughs> that's the minimum. Three is the minimum. Two is the minimum of like you have to win two games or I'm off the Clark Lee just clean house. It's not the guy. You have to win two. Yeah, minimum. I, but three games is like that's going to be the base level of at the end of the year if I can even evaluate this as a grade above a C minus. If if they have less than three wins, it'll be a D at best. Yeah, it, it just probably an F. I, at two wins. Yeah, I would still make that bet. I would make that bet. I just I I'm not as confident as I want to be in it. I'm just not yet. But it, I just it, see two wins. I'm very con- I I think this team, barring something crazy, will be two and zero. Oh. So you're basically yes. just yeah. looking at those last 10 games and saying, can they pick up one in the three winnable games that they have against Northern Illinois, South Carolina, or Missouri? Yeah. And, and I I, I don't the- know which one of those three really with how the schedule shapes up and how it's set up is the one you point to. And I know you want to point to the NIU, but Missouri and South Carolina, where they are scheduled and yes. what, where those teams are, those almost look to me like just as likely, maybe not in the gambling odds, but when we look back at the season where they were able to pick up that third or fourth victory. Yeah, and I think, Will, this is the type of program that's going to get better as, as each season goes on. Mm-hmm. They did it last year. I think they're going to do it again this year, which is why South Carolina is my – that's my trendy pick. And I think you're in a – I think you said the same thing. Um, I still look at Missouri and I want to say that one, <laughs> Just because you got Georgia before them, I mean, and it's it's also they've it's, done it before to Missouri. So you'd think on teams yeah, that we're bias. down, we're down and out somehow with Riley Neal at quarterback hitting Cam Johnson on that pass, and Cam Johnson's I would say not quite reaching expectations we had coming in when he came in from Brentwood Academy with Garland and Schoenwald. But but, but good luck one him game, at Arizona State. You know, Missouri. I'm hoping yes, good luck to him at Arizona State. He will tear it up at Arizona he'll, State. He's I would be, absolutely tear it up. I would be surprised because it seemed like his big thing was lack of ability to create separation. And yeah. a lot of that had to do with the defense was just focused on him because there mm-hmm. just weren't over the top. He's not, he's not an ISO guy. Well, yeah, there just weren't dangerous threats other than like him. that will take the top off the defense on Vanderbilt's roster. Arizona State will have that. Yeah. Also, you're playing with better lines, better quarterbacks, and you're not playing SEC defenses. Yeah. So that's so, another big one is you I don't think, have like 15 top two round defensive backs. Yeah. Obviously an exaggeration was, there, but that that's what the you're facing thing. year in, year out. That was the biggest thing for at SEC opponent. Yeah, that was the biggest thing for him. He he wanted to get the hell out of the SEC. Dude. I mean, I don't blame the guy. I really don't. So Will, that does it. I'm I'm beat. I am beat, man, after this. Um, I, this is definitely over now, maybe hour and a half. Um, yeah, but, we were overdue, though. Yeah, well, I, was, we, I was I was itching to get to the season preview yeah. and I'm and I'm itching even more to get back into the preview and recap schedule, Billy. You have it sneak it snuck up on me. Yeah. But now these last 10 days are gonna be a turn. Wall to wall. Wall to oh wall coverage from T. Here we wall. go. Here all we that's left all that's left to say is Commodore Nation, let's ride. There we go. <laughs> You've been listening to episode 172 of the Door Report, powered by Alaco Fine Wood Floors.